we've been partners and and supporters of uh, of Mars for some time. But we always like to get out and and meet the clients of Mars. The uh, you guys, the entrepreneurs, the reason that we're we're all here. So we're looking forward to spending the next hour or so with you. I was on the client side for 15 years before I came to H and K. So I worked for clients large and, and small, um, Computer Associates, MCI, EDS, uh, and then I had my own consultancy for three or four years, so no, maybe just maybe 5% of what you guys are going through. Um, and then came to H&K where I've worked on large clients, of course, but also a lot of small companies. We've had the um, privilege, really, of helping a lot of small companies bring their products to market. So hopefully that experience will, will translate today. and. Uh, um, as Marielle said, feel free to ask questions as, as we go along. I don't know if you want to add anything about your introduction. I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> my background is in journalism and I've worked um, my entire career in the technology sector. So I've, I've had an opportunity to work with the larger companies as well as uh, a lot of smaller startups and entrepreneurs as well. Um, so really looking forward to our session today and hope that it'll be interactive and um, you know, if you have questions as we go along, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, the, last, the first time I did it, we were in a very large room and it was being a uh, podcast or something to some other room, so there wasn't really a lot of <laughs> interaction opportunity, but this is much different, so feel free. Um, so just quickly on the agenda, we've got 90 minutes. We are not going to talk at you for 90 minutes, um, maybe half of that um, at the most. What we want to do, as I said, is make it interactive and leave lots of time for questions. Um, we're going to talk through, we've done the sessions before, as I said, we're going to try and make this one a little more practical, hopefully, than, than the last a few that we've done. I will talk a little bit about theory, you know, what PR is and are you ready for it, but Monta then will take you through sort of the steps and a case study, a fictitious company that we've created that just sort of take you through uh, challenges they may have and hopefully it'll resonate with you in terms of some of, the, of your challenges and, and help you to decide better whether you're ready and the kinds of things you might want to do. Uh, so, trying to start with a level set, kind of to, to, I guess, demystify some people. PR is fairly straightforward, but some people think of it as a bit of a black art. They're not really sure what it is and where the lines blur between it and advertising and other marketing disciplines. So, just a quick show of hands. How many people read the paper today? Did anybody read the paper either online or? Okay, and did you believe what you read when you read it? Yeah? Yeah? So so? Why why did you believe it? <laughs> I saw other references to the same information in other many sources. Okay. Why did you believe what you read? The actual source itself. Uh, the, the, me the meaning paper, that it's independent and yeah. right. So that there isn't a bias. Right. Okay. And and probably, you know, we hear those kind of things all the time. It's independent, it's a third party, it's it's they they're paid to get to the truth as much as you can get to the truth. And that is really the value of, of public relations. It's the goal is to get someone else to say good things about you and a, and a credible source. So I really like this. It's not necessarily a definition, but a, uh, a reference. If advertising what you say about yourself, public relations is what other people say about you. And the difference between the two is, is, is important because with advertising you pay for it, you can control the message, and you can determine when and where it's published. Uh, with public relations, first of all, you don't pay for it, but it is earned, <laughs> and you take a lot of time to actually make that happen. You know, journalists want to tell a story. They don't necessarily want to tell your story. And that's a big difference. So spending the time and effort to fit into the story the journalist wants to tell, you definitely earn that. And it's not controlled. You don't have any control over when and where and what is said ultimately. So it's a very different mode of communication and people aren't always comfortable with that. But if you want to play in that arena, you have to get to understand what that means and how you can prepare uh, to do the best job. So if we look at defining a public relations, this is another area where people kind of get confused. It's very simple. You're ma it's the management of your relationships with a variety of publics. But most people assume that media relations is public relations and use them interchangeably. Media relations is the relationship with journalists who are going to tell your story. There are a number of other publics. And you know at Hill and & Knowlton, we have practices in all these areas. But 
you know, government relations is a huge area, whether it's, it's uh, as the government uh, procurement issues as a customer, or whether it's regulatory issues that you're having to deal with, that's a public you need to deal with. Uh, investors, all of you, I'm sure, have to deal with that. People that are going to, to give you money for your company, that's, a, that's another public. Your employees, um, you know, or, or prospective employees trying to attract them to the company. Industry analysts are a big issue with, with uh, technology companies because they are market makers. They can, um, you know, review products or services and they can, they can uh, reference them for everyone and say these are good and these aren't. So that's another audience that you have to deal with separately. But for purposes of, of our work today or our presentation today, we're really going to focus on media relations, how to tell your story to journalists and how to get them to, uh, to include you in a positive way in the coverage that they write. Now, before I move on, actually, if we're talking about media relations, it, it is rather unique. There's a unique dynamic in our sector. So assuming, are most of you in, in the science and technology sector in terms of your small companies? Primarily? Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's all I've worked with in my career. And if you think about um, some of the issues around uh, media relations with those types of companies, there's, there's a lot of things at play. First of all, it's very complex. So often you're needing to distill information down to something that's reasonable and understandable for people. So very complex technologies that make perfect sense to all of us because we live it and breathe it is meaningless to a lot of people. So it's the jargon, the TLAs, we call them three-letter acronyms. There's lots of them. Um, all of those things that might be in your day-to-day -day speech, they have to be stripped out and you have to spend time to make sure that you can articulate what you want to say in a way that's that's meaningful. So distilling information is one thing you have to keep in mind. Um, the other thing, there's there's often collateral issues. So um, you know, in technology, there's there's uh, there's safety or there's often other issues around privacy with certain applications and companies that we've worked with. There can be ethical issues in biomedical areas. So oftentimes what you want to talk about draws in other issues that you may not want to talk about but that you have to be prepared to. So again, that's sort of another uh, thing. Reputation is another one because new often equals unproven. So you know, you don't always have the luxury of building on either your own reputation or, or a brand that people know. So not only are you introducing something new, it's coming from a place that nobody <coughs> understands. Who, who is this person? Why are they qualified to do this? You know, where are they coming from? So another sort of issue to deal with. And then you're often breaking new ground, right? So it's something new that people don't understand. You're changing behaviors. If you think about marketing clothing, for example, all you really need to do is, is talk about fashion or fit or you know, the material or whatever, but no one's going to question the fact that we all need and want clothing. Um, if you talk about new technologies, people don't even know what they need or if they need it. I mean, Apple's done a great job of convincing people they need everything that they make, but you know, we, I work with a company now, and a couple, uh, well, we launched this almost two years ago now. They're a telematics company, and they make um, airbag sensors and seatbelt restraints, but they also have a product called iLane, which reads your emails to you while you're driving and lets you respond. So talk about new behavior, but is it safe behavior? Is it the right behavior? There's distracted driving legislation. There's all kinds of things, hands-free <coughs> legislation. So launching that product wasn't just about, isn't this cool? This is what you can do. It was about government issues and safety issues and insurance companies and a lot of other corollary kind of issues and people that we had to consider before we just went out because otherwise we would have been buried by negative voices, right? So uh, being able to step back and think through some of these things in your, in, in your particular industry or with your particular product is, is quite important. <clears throat> okay, so if we look at what media relations can do for you, um, yes, it's a lot of work, but we do know that it works. Obviously, it enhances people's understanding of what you are and what you can deliver, builds your reputation, creates interest or demand. Um, we do at Hill & Knowlton every year a technology uh, decision-maker study. So 
we talk to C CIOs and IT decision makers across the US, Canada, and Europe. And a lot of different factors in terms of what goes into their short decision to shortlist products and to purchase. And without going into a lot of detail, um, every year people tell us that credibility and reputation is as important to them as the product or service they're going to buy. Especially in this industry because, uh, you know, you may have a great product. Are you going to be here next year? Are you going to be here in three years, five years? They want to know that you guys are a going concern, that you're going to be around for the long haul, that you have the credibility uh, to be doing what you're doing. So it's not just the product anymore and that's really an important distinction. Uh, so what is it not? I think we've talked about it. It's, it's not <coughs> advertising. It's not free. <laughs> it's not free publicity. You have to work hard to align yourself to the stories that, want, that, that the journalists want to tell. They have their own audience and they have their own um, focus. So you have to be part of that. It's not a science. It's not predictable. It's not controllable. Um, it's a very opportunistic um, uh, discipline, if you will. Uh, things can change. We can want to, you know, we've so many times, this is why I don't like doing events. You know, you go to hold an event, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and then some world event or some other issue comes up and nobody shows up. But you have to look at those, you have to be reading the news, look at those and say, how does my product or service relate to that? You know, read that article and say, how can I be part of that? Instead of saying, this is my story and I want to tell it now in this way, you have to be very flexible. It's, it's not a science. And it's not just a press release. Monta will go into this in the case study, but a press release is often the least useful way to tell your story. Uh, there are literally thousands, if you go on to CNW or any of the newswire services, thousands of press releases a day. Um, that is not necessarily the best way. It can be expensive to put <laughs> it on the wire, so you have to decide um, whether or not that's something that's useful for you at the moment. But, but you know, media relations does not equal press release. Can okay. You, um, sorry. Sure. No. Go ahead. Again? Yeah. Please. So, in terms of not a press release, um, no doubt about it. Ten years ago, kind of standard routine. Not so much today. Yeah. Could you maybe spend a couple of minutes? I don't know if that's going to be getting later, but I do want to talk about some of those other vehicles for getting the word out. Um, you know, I don't really touch upon social media. Yes. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, I mean, and this figures really, really largely in our crisis practice. We used to do crisis manuals <laughs> sat on a shelf. Who, who's going to have time to go to that? Twitter is giving your news out before you even know it's happened, right? So social media is a huge piece of it. But, and we'll go into this a little bit, and I'll talk about it here in being ready for PR, but um, there are so many different people that can help tell your story. And if you, if you are in a particular niche, for example, it doesn't mean that you're not going to go to the press. It's just that the press release is like throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And it's a less disciplined approach, frankly, unless you have very broad news. So if you are you know, in a particular segment <coughs> that is uh, relative to, say, oil and gas, and you want to talk to the journalists that follow oil and gas or the technology journalists that follow that because it's some sort of a device for that, whatever, that you need to spend the time to research. Who is writing about it? What are they saying? And you do personalized pitches to them and say, I read your article about this. We think it's really interesting. Are you aware that we have a device that allows you to do X, Y, Z and feeds into the, you know, the greening of the oil and gas industry or whatever? But without that groundwork, a press release is just, you know, a hope and a prayer almost. Mm -hmm. Because most people, 95% of the people that get it, won't be interested. So you can go directly to them. You can go to industry analysts, not only to tell your story, but to vet. Because they want to know about everything, because they get paid to know about everything. And they are paid to, to consult with large companies about products and services. So if you have an interesting product, then you go and give them a call and you say, I'd like to come and tell you about this. It fits in here. I have my go-to-market strategy. I know my, you know, my revenue model. I want to tell you about it. And I'd like your feedback. Tell me about some other competitive products you're hearing about. So it's a great way to, to sort of get a stake in the crown that way. Um, obviously, social media, again, Twitter, those types of things, you have to make a commitment. You can't have someone else writing it for you. It's an immediate and source. And often when people are in a crisis, they say, well, we'll quickly go on Twitter. But if you don't have a following and you haven't developed already a voice, 
it looks insincere and opportunistic. So social media is a bit of a different animal in that you have to have been part of that conversation for some time to have the credibility then to say, hey, this is important, or check this out, or read that. And people will do that, that favor for you because you've been adding value. Social media is, is a conversation. You have to put in, it's like a bank, you have to put in more than you take out, especially at the beginning. So those are just some of the, <coughs> sorry, my throat's really dry, some of the areas that, that you could look at beyond the press release. But we'll talk a little bit about that in the case study, and you might get a sense there. So now that we kind of know what PR is and what you have to watch for, are you personally in your, in your businesses ready for PR? There's, there's six things that we want to talk about here. First of all, you need to be ready to put a stake in the ground. It's, it's important to realize that if you're going to go out and ask uh, media and journalists to cover you, that you have to be prepared for scrutiny. They're not just going to ask you what you want to tell them. So, you know, if you, it's not enough to just have your product or service offering defined. You need to be able to talk about the industry itself. You need to be able to talk about you and your background and where you'd like to see things go. You need to talk about your go-to-market, your revenue model, you know, any contentious issues with your product. You need to think through your entire story because they will be asking about all of those things because just as you said, you know, when you read in the paper today, it gave the entire view, right? It didn't just say, here's a great new product or whatever. <coughs> so you have to really be honest with yourself if you're, if you're ready and you have everything prepared. Secondly, you have to have the right materials. Getting back to this idea that you don't really have a reputation to build on. Do you have a website? It's the first place media will go. They want to know, who is this person? What are they doing? Um, you know, do you have bios of the people in your organization? Why are they qualified to be doing what they're doing and delivering what they are? Um, a background on the company, where you're headed, where you came from, what it is you see as your vision, not just a, for this product or service, but for a whole suite of products and services. Why are you going to be here for the long haul? Um, fact sheets, spec sheets, investor presentations, sales presentations, all those kind of documents, and it's not, it's the documents themselves, but it's the process of creating those documents that forces you to make decisions and come to conclusions that will show whoever you talk to that you've got a stake in the ground, you know where you're going, you have a plan. Because the last thing you want to do is look like you're not quite sure, or that's a surprise, I hadn't thought of that. Because you can't get that reputation back if you, you know, if you, if you look hesitant when you start. Uh, know what you want to convey. There's no point in trying to get someone's attention if you don't know what you want to tell them. So do you have a really interesting story? Do you have a point of view that's unique? Do you have a market-changing product? And be honest, again, I, when I was driving in this morning, I was listening to the CBC, and there's a, a product, I don't know if anyone has heard of it, called Sumly out of the UK. Have you heard of it? Yeah, really interesting. It's for the iPhone right now. but. Um, it basically uh, uses a search engine to go, it's like a bit of an aggregator, but it'll create news um, stories in, you know, maybe two paragraphs. Something really short, really nicely, looks nice on your, on your iPhone. <laughs> and if you want to then see the rest of the story, you can go to the link. Because so many people have a hard time loading a big news story and can't see. Anyway, new application, it's going to change how people consume news. The person that developed it is 16. Um, he's got people like Ashton Kutcher and Stephen Fry behind him. So talk about the holy grail of newsworthiness and interest. It's not just the product. There's a human interest story with this kid. He's brilliant. There's the third party endorsements. So, you know, they've pulled this all together and launched and of course they're going to have real interest. And I'm not saying all of you are going to have that, but that's kind of the bar that you have to think about. The so what, who's going to care? Because it's really tough to get news out there these days. And you have to think through how you're going to get someone's attention, what you're going to tell them. I think I've kind of covered that in this next point, have something to interest the media. Because if you don't, they're going to go elsewhere. And that means that you, you have to spend time reading what they write and reading what's going on. Have others that can endorse you. Do you have a customer? 
Do you have a prospective customer? I, I like to think of a story as a pie, and you get one slice of that pie. So if you want to influence the rest of the story, you need to have other little slices of the pie that can, that can fit in for you. You need to have an analyst that, that can endorse you, or at least say, yeah, I looked at the product, it makes sense. You need to have a customer or a prospective customer, partners that you're going to partner with, a channel, distribution channel, or someone. So different people that can help endorse you and tell your story, because you only get a small piece of the pie. Yeah. Uh, on that topic, uh, when you have the stories, uh, prospective customers, what are some of the channels, or how would you suggest to, to get those stories told? To the media? To the media, or where, where should they be told? It depends on your business. So who are you trying to reach, and what is your objective right now? Are you looking for funding? Are you trying to get prospective customers? What? Both. OK. And what industry? Software. Uh, software for B2B? Marketing. marketing. B2B for marketing. For marketing. So you'd look at marketing publications. You'd look at IT technology publications. You'd look at, at sort of the niche publications and um, online and, and uh, you know, blogs and all of that that deal with that. If you were your customer, where would you be reading? Where would you be getting your news? Where would you be consuming it? You have to, you have to do some research. And you look at those, and you make your list, and then you start reading. And you go, OK, well, I see that uh, you know, Dave Webb at IT World is writing a lot about my particular software. So you can talk the technology side of it. And then you go to, to Marketing Magazine. And you talk benefits, since I've got this great new thing that, you know, and I have someone, whether it's a friend or a customer or a colleague, that's tried it and, and uh, it's going to change the way things work here from a marketing perspective. So you have to create pitches that align to those segments, but you have to do some research first. That's part of it. Um, and, and again, Monta will go through that a little bit in her, uh, in her <laughs> thing. And then the knowing what to expect. I mean, if, you're, if you've done your homework, you've, you've set up an interview. Yay, not the end. <laughs> you do need to prepare. You need to prepare um, for those contentious issues. You need to have your key messages at hand. Most interviews are done by phone. It's OK to have your, your key messages there. Make sure you know what you want to say. It's not a conversation. People make that mistake that an interview is a conversation that you need to answer every question and that you need to go off on tangents. It's fine to say, you know, that's an interesting question, but what I'm here today to tell you about is, there's these bridging phrases. I mean, we could spend two hours on media training, but um, to be able to prepare yourself to have those third party references at hand for when they ask, and even if they don't. And at the end, when they say, is there anything you'd like to add? You don't say, no, I'm fine because you can't wait to get off the phone. You say yes, and you summarize and say, and if you'd like to uh, speak to some others here, Right, so it's, it's making sure that you're well prepared before you get on that phone and that you know it's not a conversation. You have an objective to convey your messages and to convince them that you're worth writing about. So if you are ready, let's assume you've done all that work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Mont is going to take you through a little <laughs> bit about how to tell your story and uh, then the case study. Thanks, Mary. So first of all, I'm just going to say I have a bit of a cold. So <laughs> hopefully I will not break into a coughing fit in the middle of, of, uh, of this, but be patient. Um, before we move on into the case study, I'm just curious to know if after hearing from Mary, how many of you feel that you are in a place where you're ready to go out and start doing media relations? OK, that's good. How many, how many actually have done some media relations already for your company? the same ones that are ready to go out. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Excellent. OK. So before we move into the case study, just uh, wanted to cover off what we would consider to be the four steps or stages required uh, in order to, um, to undertake a media relations program. So the first is defining your story, being able to clearly articulate what it is that you want to say about yourself. The second is to res research and target. And this is, this is a really important phase in which you spend time um, understanding your marketplace and understanding who the media are. Uh, the third phase is contact and follow-up. 
And a lot of people rush to phase three and s try to start there before properly laying the groundwork of phase one and phase two. Um, and that can lead to uh, you not making the best first possible first impression in the marketplace or with the media. So it's really important to go through stages one and two before you actually go out and start to talk to the media. Well, and you've had experience as a journalist where people call and you don't think of them <laughs> as a decent resource no. because they, they're clearly just trying to talk about themselves. They have no idea what you wrote. They have no idea about the context and then you ignore them, frankly. That's what happens. We're all human, right? Yeah, and you can easily, in that case, you know, um, try to cast your net too wide, and then you haven't done your proper research, so you, you know, maybe have a consumer story and you're pitching it to a business magazine without fully understanding exactly what it is that the publication does or what they're interested in doing or that particular journalist. So all of that is, is so important to do before you ever try to pick up the phone or send out an email. And, you know, one way to get good information about a publication is to ask for <coughs> Send you an advertiser and ask for their advertising kit mm -hmm. because it'll give you all of the demographics, all of the information about who they reach because they charge people to reach that audience. So if you really think, I think this is the publication for me, call and, and say, I might be interested in advertising, send me your package and then you can really dig into it. And a lot of them too, or, or the trade publications in particular, will publish an editorial calendar at the start of the year. So then you'll know what feature topics they're planning to do each month. And a great way to get that also is, th is through their advertising um, representatives. Um, and the fourth stage is build and continue. So it, that's kind of the what comes next. And we always will say that communications is a journey. It's not something that you know, okay, good, done media relations, check, it's finished. It's, it's something that has to continue. And so you're constantly going to be researching and targeting and you're constantly going to be contacting and following up. And that's where the build and continue comes in. And that's where some of, you know, you were asking about some of the different things you can do beyond just the press release. That's where you can start to really um, build a conversation and become part of that community and uh, really establish yourself as a thought leader within, within your industry. So what we thought we would do to bring this to life is create a fictional case study. Um, it, it is completely made up, but it's made up based on our experience working with startups and entrepreneurs. Um, so just to give you a little snapshot of what this case study is, um, we're presuming it's Mary here. And Mary has um, uh, created a device that allows you to measure and track the nutritional value of your food. And uh, you can track it on your smartphone or on another device. And it's a really great uh, application for people who are trying to lose weight. But it can also be used by people who are trying to control an illness uh, through nutrition. Um, and also beneficial for parents who are trying to track and understand the level of nutrition in their children's food. So lots of great applications and lots of audiences. and. Um, Mary has done a really great job of, through word of mouth, she's got about 50 families currently using it uh, as part of a pilot phase. Um, she's got a, a friend at Health Canada who's expressed some interest in maybe incorporating the Eat Right device into uh, uh, Health Canada programs. So she's, she's done a lot, but she's done it all kind of under the radar. She hasn't launched publicly. But she's ready to go. She wants to start to launch. She's kind of looked at that checklist of what you need to do, and she's ready to go. Um, and she wants to launch within the next six weeks. She's, she, she's sort of been starting the company herself with three people. She needs to attract some more sales and uh, also development staff. She wants to um, get some more funding, and she is ready to start making some money, like generating some revenues. So it's time. So she's come to me and asked me for some guidance on media relations. So I am taking her through uh, the four steps and four stages that we just talked about. And I'm really impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Six weeks is too long. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So the first step is defining the story. And at this point, uh, this is where Mary's impatience comes out and she says, I already know my story. I know that Eat Right is a groundbreaking device. It's nobody else is doing anything like this. It's fantastic. But Mary's story is all about Eat Right from Mary's perspective. She hasn't thought through how to tell it from the different audiences that she wants to go to from a customer perspective. And so we need to walk through these questions. 
what exactly is the problem that's being solved? What are the benefits of the device more so than the feeds and speeds of the features of the device? Um, how is it different from the competition? And she's liable to say, there is no competition. There's nobody else doing anything like this. But there might be somebody doing bits and pieces of something like this. So it's really, it's important to understand and to really have thought that through. Well, the other thing is when people say there's no competition, inaction is your competition too. If you have something <coughs> brand new that people don't understand, they just don't need to adopt it. Mm -hmm. So you have always competition, whether you realize it or not, whether it's a product or, or the inability for people to adopt or understand or interest, be interested in your product. So sometimes education is, is a barrier. Uh, so there's lots of ways to look at it, but you should never assume that you don't have competition. And who will buy it? Who's the market? And what's going to make them want to buy it? And um, from a media perspective too, uh, journalists are always interested in the human interest side of the story. So in Mary's case, what I would suggest to her is that she think through how she got to this point as an entrepreneur. What is her background? Was there some reason? Did she have um, a need for Eat Right that, that, that caused her to come up with this product? You know, maybe she had an illness that she's trying to manage through diet or, um, you know, she's lost a significant amount of weight or whatever the case may be that, that sort of brings it to life. Um, and it's not enough for Mary just to go out and say these things about herself. She has to back that up with proof points. So whether that's market research that demonstrates a need for this in the marketplace, um, uh, authority figures in her case in the nutrition and food sciences industry who can talk about the importance of a product like this. She, she needs proof and she needs testimonials and, and backup and then she needs to write it all down. She needs to have all the things that we talked about before, a corporate backgrounder, an executive bio, fact sheets on the product, um, PowerPoint presentations that can be used to, to talk to analysts or to customers or to investors. Um, and that it all needs to reside somewhere online on a website that's going to be clear and easy to understand and, and, and has sections and areas devoted to the different audiences that she wants to reach. So all of that fundamental work has to be done prior to moving on to step two, which is the research and target phase. And this can, this can potentially take quite some time and it should really be an ongoing process. Um, but we can't we can't stress strongly enough the importance of knowing the media. Read, read, read. Follow the journalists on Twitter. Um, you know, just read the different publications. And in Mary's case, this would be um, journalists who cover um, health, science, food, nutrition, but also lifestyle and consumer, parenting, um, technology, Small business. There, there is, um, you know, there are publications that will write just about entrepreneurs. So there are a lot of different media that that she needs to be tracking. She needs to be keeping um, all the information that she finds out about them in a database or even on an Excel spreadsheet. Their name, their publication, their phone number, their contact, email contact information, and to do something similar with bloggers. So in in Mary's case, it would be the parenting bloggers. It would be foodie bloggers. It would be niche blogs that cover. Um, you know, uh, different illnesses and, you know, how food might, might relate to that. Industry analysts and then evangelists, which would be people in her personal network who um, would be stakeholders in her company or, or who could potentially spread the story and spread the news. Um, so all of that is one part of the research and target phase. The other part is making a plan for how she's going to launch. Um, she has to determine some kind of a hook because it's again you know it's not enough to just have a press release and send it out and say here's what I do. So in Mary's case what I would have recommended to her would be to commission some research an omnibus study that can be done in a fairly cost-effective way that would um, ask Canadians about their body image and their weight loss issues and what that might result in would be research that would show maybe 60% of men and 75% of women have issues with body image and have tried various forms of um, different products or methodologies for losing weight and um, haven't had success and enter Eat Right. And here's how Eat Right can help to make a difference. So, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily have to be that. It could be, you know, if she doesn't have the resources to do research, she could have another hook that would, would be involving her, um, some of her 50 
uh, customers who are involved in the pilot phase who can talk about the difference that the product has made in their lives. But the point is that she needs to have more of a hook than just the fact that she's launching. Um, and she also has to uh, determine timing. So she's got, a, she's got a conference coming up in six weeks. So it's perfect timing for her to be at the conference with her, her news announcement. The news release goes out that day, but she's also networking and talking about the story and really starting to create a buzz. So there's, there's a timing and there's a story that gives journalists a reason to listen to what she has to say and a reason to listen to it at that particular point in time. Step three is the contact and follow-up phase. So all the groundwork has been laid. There are materials, there's media. She knows who she wants to reach. It's, it's all there, it's all in place. There's a storyline that's developed. It's time to go out. But she doesn't have to wait until the actual launch day comes. You know, we've talked a little bit about industry analysts. You can go to them in advance. You can go to them before you go out publicly and they can help you almost to bulletproof your messages. They'll give you really good feedback. And it might just be one or two, but it's an, an IDC or a Gartner or a Forrester Research or you know, those kinds of organizations. Um, and that can be really helpful in making sure that you know what you're trying to say and that it's kind of been vetted by somebody before you actually go out and go more broadly and more publicly with them. Can you give like an example of working with IDC or Forrester, like how does it work? Is it just <coughs> mm -hmm. call, do they have a phone number to call? Or yeah, if you, if you go on their websites, yeah. um, generally speaking, they'll show, like, they show the different anal analysts who are in the different, who cover the different sectors. Yeah. And they also usually will have a single point of contact. So you can contact them and you can say, this is what my business is. This is the analyst who I think I want to talk to. And then sometimes you have to fill out a form with all of the information about your company, um, you know, what you do, where you're based, sort of what your main uh, market segments are, and then they will determine which is the best analyst for you to talk to. And you can do it face to face, you know, like let's say you're going to be at a conference somewhere where they're going to be. Sometimes they'll sit down with you face to face. Sometimes you can do it over the phone. Um, <clears throat> but you do have to keep in mind that when you, you pitch them, it's like pitching the media, you want to make sure that you have your full story. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you don't want to go and present to them because they will, they, they might go, okay, well, thanks for coming, that was really great. And then they go to write a report and they say, <coughs> you know, that this particular product, they're not ready or they didn't impress or they really haven't decided on these things. Or there's nothing that stands out from the competition. Yeah, yeah. you still have to be ready for prime time. Is there a mechanism here, I mean, my immediate thought would be to, to build that relationship earlier, credibility is have a PR firm that can do an introduction, they already have credibility and will only bring trusted resources in. So you have sort of a, a halo effect of the agency you're working with or the people you're working with. I mean, I'd like to say that's true, but I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we, the, the reality is that we work with clients that, that pay us to work with them. Now we obviously have standards, but um, yes, if we call and say there's, there's somebody we think you should see, but we'll say that because we've sat with you. Exactly. Um, we've bulletproofed it for you. We won't, you know, we, ha we want to work with clients that will take guidance because we know what works best. So that when we do call, they're pretty sure that what they're going to get is relevant, yes. Um, it doesn't mean that every company that wants to pay us to work with them has something fantastic to say. And it's really our job to, to hold up a bit of a mirror and say, you know what, maybe not, or maybe you're not using your money appropriately. So I was just thinking of this just like a sales funnel and a qualification. Yes. So this is a mechanism. It is. I mean, in the end, this, this isn't rocket science. It takes time. It's like everything, right? It takes time and effort and relationship building. And, and public relations or, you know, media relations agencies, they, that's what they do all day. So, of course, they're going to have better relationships and better knowledge than someone who's just trying to jump in and do it. It doesn't mean you can't do it yourself. It means that you need to be honest about the resources and the time it will take and uh, that it's almost better not to do anything than to just th to put your toe in the water because you're laying down a record of things you've said, promises you've made, uh, observations you've made. You're laying down a record that can be referenced at any time in the future by anybody. This company <coughs> doesn't work, that's fine, you go on to something else and then they look you up because you're going to be interviewed somewhere else. Oh, that was the guy that said this and did that. So you really, it's a personal reputation and it's a corporate reputation. You have to keep that in mind. 
Oh, yes, another question. I believe you touched upon customer uh, research, uh, both as a hook to galvanize journalists to write a story, yeah. and also to provide a human aspect. Um, I'm wondering, are you, can we do the research ourselves, or do we have to get another company to do the research for us? It, because there's a believability issue. Yes, for credibility, you'd, you'd want to have a, a, another, like a third party conduct that research for you. And there are polling firms you can hire, um, you can bring in, you, I mean, you know, you've likely done your own market research or you would do your own market research for your own purposes, um, but that lacks that credibility of being able to say, XYZ research firm has found such and such. And they do what they call omnibus studies. So you can buy a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Every month they'll go out to their base with 50 <coughs> questions or 30 questions and you can buy three of those questions. And it's not for you to get any real intelligence, frankly. It's for you to have a hook. So rather than, you know, um, the, like this, this summary or whatever, rather than to say everybody wants to get their news this way, it would be something like, you know, 80% of, of uh, youth never read the news anymore because they, they always have a smartphone and they don't have time. Some, something that would get people's attention about an issue or about something observational uh, in the population, not about your product, but then your product is if you were marketing Sumley and you were 16, um, then you know that it would be something that you could then have an entree to talk about. So these omnibus questions and studies, they're not meant to be heavy duty market research. They're meant to be observational and to give you an entree, something to, to talk to media about. Mm -hmm. uh, you said a few words about bloggers. And I was wondering if there are major differences in the ways we would, you would approach a blogger versus a journalist, and if there are differences in results, would you expect? Yes, on both counts. Um, you still have to think of them. They're just another channel. So journalists are a channel, online, offline, whatever. Bloggers are a little bit different, although they're getting to be a lot more sophisticated now. So you have to strike up a relationship with them. <coughs> They have to trust you. Um, often they're looking for um, something that they can add value to their readers. So if you provide them with a study, say, or you provided them with some insight, or you give them something that they can pass on to their readers, they want to make their blog more popular. The more readers they have, the more attention they can command, the more freebies they get, the more and more. So you have to think about how can I help this blogger get more readers? You know, it's not just, will you write about my product? So um, the, the return may be less in terms of numbers. I mean, we used to, it used to be PR by the pound, right? Impressions, you know, re pass on readership. Oh, you got 60 million impressions, which means nothing anymore. It's, it's really who, who takes the information in. So if you've chosen a blog that speaks directly to your market um, and you convince them to write about you, then it may be better payback for you than something broader. But it really depends on your situation, right? So it depends on the amount of research that you do and find who's what. I mean, we spend a lot of time for major brands with, with mummy bloggers who in the beginning had not a lot of followers, but they do now, and they're a very powerful group. So, you know, again, it comes, it comes down to research, but I, I, you can't ignore them, and you can't say they're not worth it because they only have you know, a thousand followers or something. And and when you're working with bloggers in particular, it's the same with media, but but bloggers in particular, um, it's they really expect that you know their blog well and you've been reading it and following it and it's very much more personal because it is so personal to them. Um, so that's really important too, not to just try to sort of do a blanket, even with all of the mom bloggers out there, to do a sort of a blanket pitch to all of them because they each have different nuances or different you know, different aspects of, of motherhood that they would be covering. Are there any legalities uh, regarding piggybacking on somebody else's research? Like let's say Forrester Research may have got a certain article that, you know, they found out something. And can you go across and say that according to Forrester Research, this is what we found? Not you, if it's public. Are there any legalities yeah. regarding that? I mean, can anybody just openly use their uh, research? Yeah, once it's public. Once if, it's public. Yeah, if you, are, if you have uh, purchased Forrester <coughs> research and you're a client of Forrester, that information's not 
to be given away publicly if that's their intellectual property. Fair enough, but if I'm not a planning but if, forester. Yeah, and they like to promote. They'll give you a synopsis of a study or they'll give you on their website. And if there's some data points on there, sure, they, that's what they want. They want that information to be attributed to them to increase their reputation. So yes, you can, you can use that. But isn't there sometimes some copyright on that stuff? Depends where it's published. Yeah, but if you get it off the Forrester site, and you, it, you know, as long as you attribute it appropriately, it sh it's fine. And again, if you were to put it in an ad that's running across Canada, then you'd probably need to have a look. If you're pitching it or putting it into a sales you know, presentation and it's accurate and attributed, there should be no problem. If you're ever in doubt, it doesn't hurt to just ask them. Yeah, but be prepared to wait. <laughs> I prefer to get my hand slapped after, but. <laughs> is, is there a limit on how much of it you can put in? The limit should be your own credibility, right? I mean, if you're writing something, it should be coming from you and you should be presenting a unique point of view or some additional information. If the entire thing is filled with Forrester information, then it's not really about you, right? You only use those data points sparingly to underscore what it is you're trying to say. How about if you're curating multiple different sources, but you know, are you able to, to reference you know entire um, articles? So what, what's the limit on what's reasonable in terms of quoting something? Well, I mean, you can always do a hyperlink to an article with just a dis right. right. That's what actually providing the actual right document on your website. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think well, as long as it follows a narrative, I mean, it has to kind of pass the. The snicker test. I, I call it like the snicker test. Like what, you know, if I'm going to read it and go, you know, that's really not that interesting. There's nothing new there. There's no unique point of view. If you have a really unique point of view and you need to prove it through various sources, then sure, have three or four, five, six, whatever you think you need. But make sure that the heart of the thing is your own opinion or no one will continue to read it. Or, or you, if it's a blog, or if it's a regular column or something, right? It's, it's hard to say uh, theoretically, but you know, I, I, I'd be happy to take a look at something, but I, I think it's got to be coming from you, primarily. Okay, so I'm just going to take us back to Eat Right and to uh, uh, Mary's launch, which, you know, sh she went out to industry analysts, then she sent out the re the, her news release to media and bloggers. Um, from my perspective, the results were great. She had she had coverage on three major blogs and a small trade publication. She had a call from uh, the health reporter at the Globe and Mail, who's planning to do a story next week, a roundup story. Wants to interview Mary. Um, me as the PR person, I'm very excited. Mary is crushed. <laughs> She's so disappointed. She's thinking, "This is my big launch. This is big news. How come I'm not? Where's you know CTV National News? How come I'm not on CBC Radio? What's going on here?" Um, and the fact is, there's multiple factors at play. It's not that the media aren't interested in the story. Um, you know, clearly there was some interest. There was some news value there. Um, however, the reality of newsrooms today is. Budgets are cut, uh, there are fewer and fewer journalists and fewer and fewer pages or um, available space to do their stories, so they're, they're limited in terms of how much they can cover. Um, and they also, oftentimes with startups, they like to wait and see a little bit um, because there isn't that credibility yet, despite the fact that you might have all of your third parties in place and your testimonials and everything to back it up. They still sort of want to see where you're going to go over the next three months, six months, over the next year. Um, you know, and they want to start to see uh, kind of an, an ongoing conversation. But the good news is this is just the beginning. And this is really, that would be my advice to Mary, would be this is just the beginning. Be patient. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you have a specific method of measuring your success? Well, I mean, we c you can measure it by um, number of articles. You can measure it by, uh, but there's no sort of scientific methodology around measurement. You can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for measurement <coughs> that would measure everything you could ever want to measure, or you can just look at it yourself and go, you know, that my key messages are here. It was in a Target publication that I really wanted to be in. I was quoted, and I got some calls. I got some distribution deals, I got whatever. I mean, 
a, a large program, yes, we, we make a point of measuring different like package, consumer packaged goods companies. You know, we have reports of the reports for them. Um, but, but, you know, for your purposes, I think you have to think about ahead of time a realistic goal. You know, over the next six months, I'd like to have been represented in, in these key <laughs> trades and one small business publication. And, and it's not just where you are, but it's, it's how you're represented. Were, were my key messages in there? Was I, was I quoted? If, if you're consistently being interviewed and never quoted, there's a problem there. That, you know, you're either not um, answering the questions they want, you don't have something that's of value, and you have to take a look. So you want to go back and, and say, okay, I've done these three interviews, nothing's coming from it, and maybe actually go back to the journalist and say, just curious, did I not provide what you needed? You know, it's a constant sort of reinvention of, of what you're doing. And you can use that as a benchmark for the next time okay. that you go out as well, because you'll have a sense then of, you know, this is, this is considered successful. What can we do maybe next time around to spread the word even further mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of base your, your measurement from there? Uh, sorry, quick question. A uh, segue on the topic of uh, the question of sustainability for the business. So they, they didn't really have a brand reputation when they launched, and you said it would take three to six months for the media to kind of say, are they going to be around in the near future? So from a timing perspective, <coughs> what would you advise for startups when really to reach out to the media? Case in point, we feel we have a compelling product, we feel we have a great story, but we want uh, to be on the street for a little period of time prior to engaging media to have credibility for ourselves, basically. So what's the ideal timing and time horizon? Do you have customers? We haven't launched, we haven't gone live yet. So posts going live, we don't want to press release on the day that we go live. No. We want to test it for three mm -hmm. to six months. So, so when you have customers, if, if you've gone to industry analysts, if you have people that will endorse <laughs> you. So there's all those things we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's the milestones. Do you have some milestones? I mean, when you launch, people will go, great, you launched, you know, let's wait and see. Yeah. Then you get some customers. So you go back to them and say, just wanted to keep you updated. We got some great customers if you ever want to talk to them. And then you go back and say, we just signed a distribution deal if you're, you know, interested in that. And then you go back and say, you know, I was just speaking at such and such and some interesting feedback I got from, from clients about this. You keep feeding your key reporters or whoever it is you're dealing with your story and you, you just sort of in drips let them know what's going on. It's not necessarily a pitch every time, but you keep them up to speed and eventually they'll go, yeah, there's that guy and he's actually sent me quite a few things and now I'm doing a story on this particular type of software. I'm going to give him a call. To stay top of mind basically over a period of time. Yeah, especially in your milestones because that will convince them that you're making progress. If you launch and they don't hear from you for a year, not good. Well, they'll probably have forgotten. <laughs> probably the next day. <laughs> yeah. Because they get, you know, upwards of two to three hundred pitches and emails and press releases every single day. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you have to do something to stand out. And if that's becoming kind of a knowledgeable source or sort of an ongoing source, mm -hmm. then that can stand you in good stead. One question. How yeah. important is it uh, who within the company that uh, makes the contact? <coughs> are featured with the, with, the, with the media. So I didn't hear the beginning of it? So, so who, how important is it who uh, that makes the contact? Does it have to be the founder or the CEO? Or could Anyone can make the contact, but it's a good point. You have to decide who the spokesperson is right. going to be. I'm assuming that with entrepreneurs, it's usually the entrepreneur themselves. But yes, one of the founders or whoever is going to be able to speak with passion and clarity about what they're doing. And that's really the differentiator you may have from a large company, frankly. You've got an idea, you brought it to fruition, you're passionate about it. It may have come from, as Monta said, a personal experience or something you know, that made you come to this. So you have a human interest element there that you should play up. And uh, it should come from the person that is really you know, going to be the voice and the face of the company for some time to come. And, and sometimes you know, founders or certain entrepreneurs, they're not that person. They don't want the spotlight, they don't want to do it. That's fine, but make sure you get someone as close to that as you can, someone that is you know, part of it, not someone part-time or someone you just hired or whatever, because it just doesn't work. It doesn't feel real, and it actually may feel a little um, like a gun for hire, and you haven't, you're haven't really not where you should be at this point. Okay, 
Oh, did you have another question? Yeah. Um, do you find that the strategy used in terms of approaching a journalist differs from, uh, say, a blogger as opposed to somebody from McLean's? The fundamental is still there. Um, you, you, you have to have a story that's tailored and personal to the outlet and the person that you're trying to reach, whether it's a blogger or whether it's McLean's magazine. Your tone and your style of approaching them um, might differ a little bit. You might be a little bit more formal with a McLean's magazine, and maybe you try to match your tone to more um, the tone of the blogger. Um, but ultimately, you know, the best recommendation is just to know know the person, know their interests. You know, if you're if say you're trying to pitch someone at McLean's and you know that they've written something. Um, right off the bat, if you're a new company, just admit that you're a small company, you're just, just yeah. getting started. Oh yeah. I think you want to be authentic. You don't want to try to pretend that you're something you're not. Yeah. But going to a McLean's, I mean, going to a blogger and, and saying that they may have an opportunity to cover you much sooner than a McLean's. The McLean's may go, great, we're going to keep it on file. They do, they keep it on file. Uh, but like I was saying here, then you want to feed them, you know, the same reporter if you get someone who's actually actively listening to you over time and try to align to a story that they're working on because they're, won't, they're not going to feature you. It's a news magazine and they're going to try um, and tell their big stories and if they see that you're an example they can use in a story, then they may call you. So your expectation should be very different of those outlets. But you know you still have to do your research and your homework, and then personalize each one. Yes. I'm curious, a little bit off top, topic, but I'm curious uh, if, if you could talk a little bit about crisis response and some of your experiences there. <laughs> Lots. Um, yes, it is a complex area in technology, and things can go <laughs> wrong. You know, I've been involved in exploding batteries and fires and you know, things of that nature. So crisis is its own seminar. Um, what we recommend, we call it the CAP formula, concern, action, perspective. Whatever happens, it's 90% concern. Now, whatever's happened, you know, we feel we're concerned and our, our, our you know, um, thoughts are with the, the family who was injured or the person in the hospital or the, you know, the customer who was inconvenienced or whatever. The, the action, what we're doing is a full investigation about XYZ perspective. The good news is that it wasn't, uh, it was only uh, limited to Ontario. The product didn't make its way out, whatever. Um, it's really important from the beginning to focus on, on concern and to get all the facts. You always make sure that you, um, that you seed uh, authority to the authorities that are on site, whether it's fire or police or Health Canada or the government or whoever it is. Um, and you go from there. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, it's, it's a long haul and you have to have the right spokesperson and you have to be renewing your messages as things change. When we do crisis simulations, we have uh, escalations every 15 minutes because those things can happen quickly. But generally, it's, it's an opportunity to communicate really effectively, and you have to be on your game. Um, so I don't know if you've had a situation or you want to talk about something offline after. I'm happy to chat with you, but it, it's, uh, it, yeah. <laughs> it is something that you have to comprehend at some point, for sure. What qualifies as a crisis? Well. Everybody thinks often that they have a crisis. There's issues, so we have issues management, and then crisis and issues have the ability to become a crisis. A crisis is really where your reputation is at stake. So you can have an issue, but it's, uh, it's contained, it's an issue, a problem, a complaint from someone in your, one of your customers or whatever, but they haven't yet, they haven't gone to the media or there hasn't been a loss of something or there isn't a lawsuit. So it becomes a crisis when your reputation is on the line, right? And what we try to do is make issues not turn into crises. A lot of crises people think of as explosions and accidents and, and those are the ones you can't control. But a lot of crises you can, you just didn't recognize the issue and spend the time there before it 
it bubbled up to become a crisis. It's kind of a broke guitar, United broke the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and they didn't. Well, there's there's all kinds of schools of thought on that, but they didn't move they didn't move quickly enough on that for sure. Um, but yeah, with big companies have people on Twitter and and LinkedIn and Facebook and everywhere else all the time, just monitoring for their name and and responding very very quickly because those are all customer service issues. If you have a teenage daughter, there's usually one every morning. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we got to move on. I guess we're almost. Well, yeah, we've got some. One more question. I was just going to ask about industry analysts and the best approaches, uh, best uh, practices on how to approach them. I've noticed a lot of online publications already have rep, uh, relationships with the analysts, so you would pay them to reach out to them to endorse you. Do you think that's a better approach than uh, approaching them yourself? Quoting an analyst like Carmi Levy or Michelle Warren or someone like that? So they have a, rep, um, a relationship with the analyst that they can um, call them for comment. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, not, sorry, that's not normally done on a paid basis. Never. No. Because it's, it's in the analyst's best interest. It helps their reputation. Mm -hmm. They're seen as an authority. So, so you would call Carmi or you would call Michelle mm -hmm. because you want the people that you know are being quoted and you call them and say, when you're ready, I've got something I think you'd be really interested in. I saw you were quoted on, you know, th this area. In CIO Magazine. In CIO Magazine, and it made me think that you'd be interested in what we're doing. We have a kind of a unique approach. We've got a product that does blah, 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 blah. Would you be interested in coming in for a, you know, yeah, a demo or, or a discussion? And if she says yes, then the next time she's called by those media, there's another voice for you. In addition, if you get an interview, you can say, you might also want to call Michelle Warren because she can tell you a little bit more about it as well. Okay, so step four of our, um, of our media relations process, sort of going back to the Eat Right example, um, so just as a kind of a, a recap, Mary got all her ducks in a row and she went out and launched and she wasn't totally happy. And my recommendation to her was don't give up, don't stop there. There are a lot of other things you can do. And in Mary's case, what she did was she set up a blog, she set up a Facebook page and she uh, set up a Twitter account. And she started to um, develop a bit of a following online and comment on other blogs, comment on other Facebook posts and other pages and, and really become a, an online influential in the online space in the field of nutrition and um, uh, childhood obesity. And that was, uh, what that has done for her is translated over into traditional media coverage as well. Because media often, when they're looking for sources for stories, will go online and see who's talking about it online and who's, who's an authority online, and then interview those people as sources for stories. So she ventured into the social media arena, but other recommendations for her would be to be at trade shows and conferences and be networking and be speaking. Even if she doesn't have the resources to have a booth at these conferences, still worth going um, in order just to be, again, kind of just part of that conversation in the industry. Um, to write articles on nutrition and on the various topics that are related to her business and submit those to trade publications who will accept, some of them will accept byline articles. Um, and to also look at opportunities with partners where possible. So if she was, if she was say, aligned with, um, you know, maybe a, a major grocery store or something like that, they often will have partner PR opportunities um, for, uh, it helps them to, to uh, the smaller business can act for them. It's almost a proof point of some of the things that they're doing. So it, it's worthwhile to look at what partner opportunities might exist and jump on board with those. Um, and then to maintain relationships with the media, which is something that requires an investment of time. And, you know, in Mary's case where she'd had a journalist at the Globe and Mail say interested in interviewing her in a week's time, she knew it wasn't going to be a big feature story about her. So she was kind of thinking, well, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe I'll just wait until they're ready to write something big about me. That would be a mistake. It would, it would uh, 
be hugely beneficial for her to get on the phone with that journalist or sit down with him and, and explain what Eat Right does, uh, even if she ends up with, you know, maybe one little line or one little quote in a much bigger story because that just helps to start to um, initiate a relationship and initiate some additional exposure for the company that can be built on over time. And then as time goes on and, you know, the, the, you move into that three month or six month or one year phase, as she is um, bringing on new customers, uh, making new partnerships, hiring new people, getting financing, she should be going, whether it's a news release or a pitch or whatever the vehicle would be, to continue to communicate that news out to the media on an ongoing basis. But beyond that, she shouldn't just be talking about her company and what it can do. She should be trying to become a knowledgeable source or an expert source um, on the topic. So if she, she reads, say she reads an article and there's some controversy in it and she has a different or unique um, perspective on it and she's already developed a relationship with certain journalists, she could get in touch with those journalists and say, I saw that you were writing about the childhood obesity epidemic, here is what I think. And it doesn't necessarily have to be tied directly back to her product. It allows her to become more of an authority or more of a thought leader, um, which can go a long way towards building overall exposure. So, you know, the point of all of this is again, what I said before, that communications is a journey. It's not something that, you know, it just ends. Um, it needs to be ongoing and once you start it, you should be prepared to continue it. And it does require you know, it does require um, a time commitment and effort and research, but it is ultimately worth it in the end because it does work. <laughs> this is actually a, a handout, um, which you can take if it's at all useful. Um, it's just a reminder, I mean, the idea about being successful in PR, we've <laughs> talked a lot about that, understanding your audience, your story, and all of that. But then the next three, um, blocks are really once you, which we didn't have time to go into, kind of media training stuff, working with the media, um, respecting deadlines, they are really important. If you say you're going to get something to a journalist and you miss it even by half an hour, when they're, if they're going to print or they're going to, and you um, don't deliver, they will not forgive you. <laughs> so when you're working with the journalists and media, deadlines are everything. Um, be knowledgeable, be open to sharing the spotlight, that tiny sliver of pie, or nothing. I mean, it's a two-way relationship. If you could provide them with something that helps them, they will be forever grateful. Whether they can fit you in that story or not, they will really appreciate it. If you can educate them on something that they didn't know anything about, um, particularly in the technology field, the technology trades, they, get, they hire people out of J school, and we spent many a uh, lunch hour telling them all about tech so that they could go off and write about it. Not anything to do with our particular clients at the time, but it sure, sure set up a nice relationship where they were quite willing to take our call. So if you can educate them on something, be prepared for long lead times. You may do an interview and not see anything for months. We often have in, especially with newspapers now, they'll do those special supplements, then they don't get enough advertisers and they cancel it. So they've done the interview and you think this is going to be great and it never shows, but they file it and they keep it for another time. So you have to be very patient. Or um, it might show up online and not in print. There's right. that option too. Yeah. And you know, relationships count, yes. They help people pick up the phone, but content counts more. So all of the things we've told you about preparing, having the right story, that trumps a relationship anytime. Just because I can pick up the phone and call someone at the Globe does not mean they're going to cover the story just because they're willing to answer. So that is key. If you actually do get the interview, I think we talked a little bit about this, keeping your messages nearby, um, preparing your references in advance, reviewing sensitive issues, and practice may feel awkward but but practice because you don't want to be in a position where you're fearing questions have someone ask you the toughest questions you can think of about your product and service i think sometimes we find um you know when we're preparing spokespeople for interviews and we will do that we'll take them through what we think the questions are going to be and some of the questions are kind of you know we call them rude it's a rude q a and the executive will say well i don't want to answer that but 
that's a, you know, you don't have a choice if the question gets asked. You ha you're, you're far better ahead if you've prepared yourself ahead of time um, and you know that it might be coming. So be honest with yourself about what some of those rude questions might be. And, and often it'll be, what do you think? What do you really think about the Petraeus situation, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. My personal opinion isn't at, at issue here. What's important is you don't want to get yourself pulled into things that you have no business talking about and don't want to talk about. So um, again, another whole session around media prep. But the other thing on the actual interview performance, everything is on the record. I had a friend who worked for a publication in Chicago. He would get someone on the line and then say, hang on for a minute. I just have to put you on hold while I go do something. And then he'd listen to them talking about what they weren't going to say or what they did want to say. And, and then he'd come back and ask them that very stuff. <laughs> so. <laughs> We, you know, once you're on the phone, everything, even the small talk is on the record. It's not to say you should be stilted or awkward, but you don't make jokes about things that are inappropriate or just that you don't, whatever you come out of your mouth, picture it in print. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to mention that when you were talking earlier that I, from a few things that I've done with my business, there's been, it's been really helpful to think that I'm talking to a lot of people, mm -hmm. not just that one person, because they try and get really comfortable right. and friendly and get your, you know, your... Guard your, down. Yeah, mm -hmm. get you really comfortable, and they, they, it's not like they want you to slip, but I just found it really helpful to always think, okay, I'm not just talking to this person. I'm talking to the Globe and Mail, or I'm talking to... Or you're talking to your customer. Talking to my customer. I'm talking to millions of people, potentially, and that really helped me, because... Yes, I want to have my notes and stuff, but it's so easy to get off topic. No, it really is. And that's why I say it's not a conversation. When we media train people, I find like really good salespeople are sometimes the toughest to train because they're trained to, to look, to nod, to listen, to repeat. You don't repeat, you know, like how long have you been beating your wife? Well, I don't beat my wife. And now I've said I don't beat my wife. And that's my quote. You know, it's, <laughs> it, you, you don't repeat what they what they say. You don't repeat the questions. You don't repeat the negative. There's just so many things. And it's not that they're out to get you. I mean, they're busy. They want to get an interesting story. They'd like their story to be on the front page of the ROB. And in order for that to be the case, they want something fun and interesting. They know how we prepare you. They know that you've thought about what you want to say. And they're just trying to get you, you outside of that a little bit to see if to they get can... get some color into the story. You know, and, and they'll, they'll pause. They'll say, well, how so? And it's really awkward, long silence. And you go, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that. Why not? <laughs> you know, and that these awkward silences. And that's why it's not a conversation. You have to be able to sit there and go, well, I think I already answered that. And just wait them out, <laughs> you know, if it's, a really, if it's something you really don't want to go to. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to approach it. But I think to be prepared, to think that you're speaking to a lot of people, that's an excellent way to think that it's not a conversation. Stick to your areas of expertise. Mm -hmm. If the journalist does say, uh, you know, we're off the record, should we trust the journalist? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we're all off the record, and then, OK, let's go on the record. Uh, it's, it's your own call. I mean, why would they have to tell you you're now off the record? Why, why, what would they be asking you that would be so... Or some more background, just, you know... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they need that. I mean, whatever background you want to give them, people often say I was misquoted. The reality is they can't quote what you don't say. But people <laughs> aren't misquoted, they're misunderstood because they said too much, but they didn't want that part quoted, right? So there's a great piece of footage we always use in media training with Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes, and she's with the head of Apotex. I don't know if anyone had seen this, and he um, he thought the cam they were they had stopped to change cameras, but it was still running on the other camera. And he was talking about this woman that was suing them, and he said, "Well, she's crazy." And Leslie Stahl said, "Did you just say she's crazy?" Well, well, I said something to you because we were off the record. She goes, "We weren't off the record. I'm not your friend." <laughs> That's the bottom line. They're not your friends. They're nice people, and they just have a job to do. But if you can, not demonize them, but if you can try to think of them as not your friend and not a conversation, it's helpful. Not that you're going to be rude or mean to them, but it helps put them in a box where you are then not tempted to get too comfortable. Because you, you really can 
get into situations and say things that you don't want. And even if it's not anything damaging, it might just take away from your message. You might start, you know, the, a, another cardinal rule, you don't name competitors, mm -hmm. right? Because then you're quoted and they can use the quote talking about other and giving airtime to your competitors, right? So there's just a lot of things to keep in mind and you have to make sure that you are disciplined. And it's hard to be disciplined if you suddenly think that you're off the record or that you're buddy buddies or that, you know, oh, you know so-and-so? Yeah, we know them and that's all fine, but, but it's an interview and that's all it is. So you really, you have to be disciplined. We can just add a, an example that I found absolutely amazing. It was uh, Pierre Trudeau during the FLQ <laughs> crisis was, uh, was mm. kind of like ambushed out front of uh, the steps in one of the, one of the buildings in Ottawa. Just and watch he, me. And he basically, is, they try and lead him down all these roads and he just handles it brilliantly. And then he ends it in, a, in just a beautiful way as well, like keeping that relationship with the, with the journalist strong. If you search like Pierre Trudeau FLQ on YouTube, mm -hmm. you'll find it's 10 minutes and it's brilliant. Yeah. And that's, I mean, a lot of politicians, that's what they're so good at, just brilliant at it. And uh, it looks easy, but it's not. Because to maintain the feel of a conversation while you're blunting what they want from you and getting your own message out is actually a feat and worth practicing. So have somebody sit down with you and ask you the toughest questions they can think of about your business. And think of some quotable quotes, like actual phrases. It doesn't have to be a fully memorized sentence, but some sort of little phrases that you might want to see show up in a story. Like you'll see often in a story, a pull quote, we call it, which is, you know, it's pulled out and highlighted somebody's quote. And those are things that are memorable, pithy, short. Um, and they usually don't come right off the top of their heads. It's no. usually something that's been planned out ahead. And then they go, and then they pull it out like they just they came off so the top smart. of their heads. Yeah. So I think that's really the end of the formal presentation. I know we've had lots of questions all the way through and we're almost at the end. I don't know if there's any other questions. I just had one about the uh, block that we passed over, the preparation. What did you mean by keep your key messages close? Well, if like close by, physically close by, oh. because okay. most of them are on, uh, most interviews are on the phone. And it's okay to have, I usually w prepare clients with three key messages and two or three controversial issues <laughs> and how to bridge back from those controversial issues back to one of your messages. Not that you're gonna just keep repeating them, but sometimes you don't get to it. And at the end they say, is there anything you'd like to add? And you don't say no, you say yes, because often too, if they tape it or even when they're busy, if it was a long interview and they're lazy or they're behind, they'll take the last few things you said. So you reply, you go, yeah, I'd just like to reiterate that blah, blah, blah. And they go, okay, great, thanks. And that is often a quote that they'll use. So okay. have them there and be ready to use them. Mm -hmm. So the, the process for <coughs> PR, if it's a service-oriented company versus a product company, mm -hmm. I think you kind of com uh, uh, made some comments about that. Um, but is there kind of one or two things you could just summarize? If it's you know PR with a service company where there's not a product, versus a product software type company <laughs> where there is a product. So one is a kind of show me, here's what we can do. Mm -hmm. The other is more of a story. Is PR equally important with each of those separate kinds of organizations? Yeah, I, I think it's always important. I mean, of course, I guess I'm biased, but I think it's important. When you can show someone a product, you could, you could seed a product. Uh, like with the Eat Right thing, I could seed it with Leslie back at the Globe, <laughs> let her try it. A service depends what the service is. Um, you can still do that with a high-end customer and have them become your case study. Um, you know, you can do a desk side briefing where you have a journalist come in and experience whatever it is or take them somewhere to experience whatever it is. It's important for them to get a sense of it. It may be a little bit harder, um, but it's still very important for them to get a sense of it. And in that case, case studies and even a little bit of research that says this is the kind of thing people want and need is probably a bit more important than on the product side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. What do you suggest to begin with the PR? How do you begin and what kind of budgets or what kind of sums of money are you? I'll give you my card. <laughs> 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 um, well, if you're going to begin with what we talked about, the research, the art, the six are you ready? Go through all those. If you're ready, 
then you can start making calls, right? If you think you need help with that, there are lots of little, like freelancers that will help pretty <laughs> inexpensively. There are, um, you know, services that you can, that you can have done. It, it just, it depends what you're looking for and how much and how broadly. Is it just in Toronto? Is it just in Ontario? Is it regionally? Is it English and French? Is it, is your biggest market in the U.S.? There's just a lot of, so it's almost impossible to say this is a budget or this is what you do. I'm happy to talk to you after and give you some guidelines, but it really depends what you're trying to achieve. Uh, what are the differences between freelancers, you know, big agencies, what should we as entrepreneurs look at fundamentals? Who does what? Who specializes in what? Well, f I mean, freelancers can be very good, but they've often come from agencies or they, you know, they have the experience, um, but they're one person. And so all I would say is if you've got a product or a service that's is complex or needs broader uh, communication, you may want to get an agency involved who has you know, healthcare experts, technology experts, government relations experts, all of these people that can come together quickly and go, this, 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 and this needs to be done. So freelancers can work good, sort of the smile and dial, work the phones trying to get you some coverage for sure. They can maybe help you with social media, but if you've got a bigger issue that you're trying to grapple with or you're looking for a longer term program, sometimes it is better actually to get an agency that has a bit more breadth to help. Um, a lot of good tips there. One of the challenges I find is that it's a real time sucker. Yeah. So, I mean, we're all trying to, um, you know, put the bacon on the table, <coughs> make some calls, da 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 da. So, at the same time, there's certainly a case for the public relations reaching out to the media and so on and so forth. No doubt about it. What would you, looking back on some of your customers, maybe some case studies, whatever the case would be, um, taking that away that it's, t you know, the time consumed is time away from sales? Any ROI measurements or things to consider when we leave? Obviously, there's things that get, you know, in the paper um, that you know might lead to something, but it's it's always hard to look at that. Is it did a sale two years ago come from that article? You know, that type of thing. Any tips? Any thoughts on that as we go home and review all those wonderful things? That uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're trying to convince someone or you need to talk to them about it. I mean, I look at it, there's just so many ways that having a, a solid reputation gives you license to do things. If you think back to that, um, the, the pet food recall, yeah. menu foods, yeah. Um, half the reason they got into so much trouble is because nobody actually knew who they were. People were shocked that they were actually the ones that were manufacturing everything from cheap cat and dog food to the very expensive lines. This, this whole thing, blew out of control because people were like, well, who, why was I paying more? It ruined their brand. They had no, they just thought, well, we're an OEM, we sell to all these other people, we don't need to have a brand or a reputation or we don't need to worry about it. They had really no decent spokesperson, they had no crisis preparation. Um, we ended up working with them on it, it wasn't me, thankfully. <laughs> but um, they hadn't really thought about it. And, and the license that would have been given to them if they'd had a reputation and if they'd had built this over time would have made a huge difference. I mean, I, I can point to so many things we've been able to do through PR from sales to, um, you know, to partnership deals to all kinds of other, you know, marketing, ROI and whatnot, but they're very specific to that situation. I just think that you, especially as an entrepreneur, have to think about your personal credibility and the corporate credibility. And if you want to play in the big leagues, you have to act like that. And it's a cost of doing business. Uh, I can't imagine anyone would think that you know, we don't need salespeople because that's the lifeblood. Well, I, I equally don't think people should say, well, we don't need to worry about communications right now. We'll worry about it when we have something to communicate. It doesn't work that way. So I guess the short answer is I don't have one particular way to look at ROI. It depends on the case. It depends on the case, but it's a, it's a very important piece of, of your marketing mix. I can share an anecdotal piece with our company. Five years ago, <laughs> we didn't have any public relations type of work, very limited. At the time when we looked at our sales funnels, when it came down to the final sale, we would win on everything except for who the heck are you? We don't know about communications, and 60% of our sales would disappear because of that. Uh, currently, we do have uh, 
some good media exposure in the areas that we, we, we target. Clients don't question who we are when we go into our verticals. So that has been a reputation. Opens issue. the door. This, 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 so this is a pitch for a first time purchase, not a repeat purchase. Uh, it's a first time purchase. Yeah. So it, it, it's really, the, for us it was, the name is unknown, so it's untrusted. And uh, this just, it's just a halo effect. Yeah, it is. And I mean, how, how do we all operate today? If you want to buy something, what's the first thing you do? You go online and you check it out. How much, where, what have people said? That's the world we live in. If you don't have a reputation that's been built by other people, because I, I don't go to the company's website, I go to other spots, then, you know, this is the kind of thing that can happen as well. I think uh, we have time for one more question back here. Just that one, one other thing on that uh, regarding the ROI is just when people are uh, uh, registering for uh, on your website or, or when you're getting a sale or whatever, uh, a lot of companies just have a simple question or a list of things. Where did you hear about us right. or how did you c come to us? Uh, and, and that you can just plug into your CRM even if you just have, you know, get one of the uh, a, a low cost CRM to get uh, track your leads and your <laughs> sales and your, your uh, prospects. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much, um, Mary and Mata. That was a really great presentation. Thanks. Um, lots of great information and, and tips for everyone to leave with today. So I have the handout that Mary mentioned. Um, if you want to grab one on your way out, we'll also send in about a week's time. We'll send um, the lecture video along with the slides and a short survey. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to give us some feedback on the presentation and let us know, um, you know, what other topics you'd like to see in the series. So, okay, great. Great. Thank you.